Y'all have to bear with me this morning because we have a lot to get through. And oh, we got plenty of time because I talk fast, right? <laughs> so um, before we get into all of the youth stuff this morning, um, Morgan and I are going to. Uh, we wanted to thank everyone for helping us. Um, Where's EJ? See, I told you. <laughs> I told her yesterday we were talking. We had we went to a girls' conference yesterday in Greenville, and um, we had some good conversations there and back. And I told her, I said, I'm not an emotional person unless the Holy Spirit is is moving, and the Holy Spirit is moving this morning. So, y'all are gonna have to bear with me. But um, we wanted to thank everyone for helping us go to Peru. Those of you that gave um, financially, and those of you who prayed for us. We had an incredible time while we were there. Um, we wanted to share a few things with you from our trip. So um, I think he's gonna play some pictures. They're just gonna kind of roll through. I might stop at a couple of them, but um, this was the group, and it was a group, it was the North Carolina Women's Assembly of God mission trip. So this is actually women and one young gentleman, he went with his mom, um, who went together from all across the state. And then we also had one, um, legend of the Assemblies of God go with us too. Um, she's in the middle, kind of the white hair. <laughs> um, she actually, her and her husband are missionaries to Africa, um, but they are living near Liberty University in Farmville. But she actually came and went with us and we actually called her our Yoda for the trip. Um, she was our go-to. <laughs> but um, we had an incredible time while we were there and we just, um, we want to share some of that with you. So um, some of the ministry that took place, we went there to work with North Carolina uh, missionary Phyllis Rose. Um, we've had her here in the past, um, but she is there and she is starting a new program called Chicas de Promesa, and it's Girls of Promise. And it's an after school program for fourth through sixth grade girls. Um, and these schools, they're starting it as like two pilot programs in two schools, and the two schools that are, are Hope Child Schools, which are run by the AG as well. They are completely sponsorship programs. So when those missionaries go and they're itinerating, they're gaining sponsors for the children that pay for their uniforms, that pay for their, their schooling and their meals and stuff that they get while they're there. But the principal handpicks a small group of girls that they think can really utilize this extra encouragement because the areas where these schools are located are very poor. Um, the one school that we were in had an average monthly income of $200. Um, and if you look on the, the hill, I know that's kind of a far away, but if you look, there's like a little yellow line that you see going up. Those are stairs. Um, and they're lucky that they have stairs built in. Most of them don't have, um, there's no roads to get up. So it's either a stair or a pathway that they have to climb to get to their home. And none of those homes have water or power. Um, so Lima is in the middle of a desert. It's in the valley at the foot of the Andes and the Pacific Ocean, and there is no rain there. It's a dust ball, <laughs> really, and um, you see dust everywhere. But the school um, locations, there's a lot of gang activity, um, a lot of drugs, a lot of sex trafficking, all kinds of things. And so these girls are handpicked that are at the highest risk of falling prey to those things. Um, and so this is a way for them to encourage, <laughs> encourage these girls to stay strong and keep moving forward. Um, we were able to pour into the lives of the kids while we were there during the day. We had different age groups come up from pre-K all the way up through sixth grade and some in high school um, that we got to minister to and basically do miniature vacation Bible schools with them for the two days that we were at each school. And then in the after school program, we got to do the Chicas de Promesa program, which um, I was a part of that, and um, we got to train the teachers. And so um, Morgan got to work with the pre-K through sixth grade during the day, and then I, did the, um, I got to work with the Chicas during the night. But while we were there, we actually got to go to Phyllis's um, apartment and it was really neat because we got to see firsthand um, the household items, the furniture that the North Carolina Women's Ministry purchased through Touching the World Fund, which the women's ministry here has not participated in that in quite some time. But ladies, get ready. 
because we're going to. Um, also, we got to see and utilize a vehicle that the North Carolina youth purchased for her um, through Speed the Light organization. And again, youth, we have not been doing that, but get ready because you're going to learn to have a heart to give. Yeah. Um, and we also got to see the material that the BGMC program of North Carolina purchases. So it was really awesome to see what we do here go into effect there. And the money you give um, goes to absolutely further the kingdom of God in other countries. If you could pause there for me, um, Ben, I almost called you Michael, sorry. <laughs> um, but I do have an announcement while I'm on this screen right here. So the women's ministry retreat is coming up in March. And I tried to get one speaker, and it didn't work out. And I was really disappointed. And I was like, man, I'm really bummed. Y'all are going to have to hear me again. And then God opened a humongous door. So we are going to have the legendary Merle McCulley. Um, she's the one standing right beside me, um, in front of me, kind of. Um, she is going to come and be our speaker at the women's retreat. Her and her husband, Bob McCulley, have been in the mission field in Africa since 1976. She is a powerful and an amazing woman of God, and she is going to come. She is so excited. And I'm going to tell you, when God moved doors, God moved heaven and earth to make this possible for us this weekend because she was booked for our weekend. And then she had gotten the call just before coming in to the trip in Peru that there may have been a change, and there has been a change. So she is going to be there, and I am so excited. Um, so you don't have to listen to me this year. You get to be blessed by Merle, and she is awesome, and you will be blessed. But um, also, right behind her and beside me in the purple and white shirt with the glasses is Phyllis um, Rose. She's the missionary that we were there working with that is a North Carolina um, missionary. Um, but like I said, Morgan worked with the elementary kids, the pre-K through 6, and so she's going to come up and share a little bit um, about her experience. Oh, I, there's a mic right there. I don't need a mic. Yes, you do. Right. You have to. <laughs> there you go. Is it on? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, well, I worked with the pre-K through six. six. Um, oh, it was really good working with those kids. It kind of gave me an experience for what I'm going to be in store when I start teaching. Um, but... It was also really rewarding seeing how happy those kids were. <laughs> they were just so happy. They were so excited and so happy. And getting to talk with some of them in that second school, I don't know if you can see it, the, the little boy in the red, he, um, his name was Samim. Um, and after we finished doing the, the tie-dye tiles, <laughs> it's so cute. Um, after we finished doing their, their tie-dye tiles, we gave them some time to color their little pieces of paper. And um, he came up to me, and obviously I couldn't understand what he was saying, mm -hmm. but <laughs> what I did understand was he was saying, Mi corazón, mi corazón, and that's my heart. <laughs> and he handed me his little piece of paper. <laughs> and he colored little orange hearts all over it. And it was so, it was so sweet. <laughs> because it seemed like he was probably the one, the one kid who didn't really like to listen. <laughs> because the whole time he was just doing his own thing. The teachers were trying to work with him and he just didn't want to do it. And then when I came over and worked with him, after we were finished, I told him he could color. 
And then a couple minutes later, he came up to me with that little piece of paper. And he handed it to me, and he started talking, mi corazón, mi corazón, and then he walked away. So I was like, I don't know if he just wanted to show me this or if he left it. So I had um, one of our translators ask the teachers, and they said, yeah, that's, that's our little artist. He gave that to you. And it was just, it was really rewarding getting to work with those kids and getting to see how happy they were. And it makes me so excited to teach because I want to see that excitement when I teach. I want to see that excitement in the kids that I teach in America because they're in such a bad place. I mean, not bad, but they don't get what the kids in America get. They don't get all that luxury. And they were really excited just to be there, just to be there and get to do all that fun stuff and listen to the lessons. They were so excited. And I want to see that excitement. I want to see it. Morning. It made me so happy. And I do miss it. A lot of those kids didn't listen, but I miss it. <laughs> so don't go anywhere again. So, um, so while, um, we were there after the first day of ministry in the first school. Um, the lady that Morgan was working with found out that she wanted to be an elementary teacher. And um, we were working to put the materials back together for the next day. And she just sat out of the blur of the moment. She just looked at Morgan and she said, so you want to be a teacher? And Morgan said, yes. And she said, okay, tomorrow teach the kids a song in Spanish. Oh. <laughs> and Morgan said, okay, without any hesitation. And so... Morgan loved it. The kids loved it. Um, the teachers that were at the school loved it. The principal came up and she started joining in and she loved it. Our team members just jumped right in and loved it. And Morgan, when we got into the van and we were just kind of reflecting on the day, she was like, I want to go home and teach the kids at home for Youth Sunday. So at this time, if I can get all my kids' own kids to come forward. Come on, kids' own kids. Just stand up right up here. You're going to get them lined up for me. And you can just stand up on this, these two steps and face them out there. Come on, remember, we've got to get real loud. Come on together. Come together. <laughs> no, we don't do that. It's even easy enough that the adults can join in. I promise. So... All right, thank you guys. You guys can have a seat. I will say that um, they're usually not this timid. <laughs> and if you don't believe me, feel free to join me back there, and you can see for yourself that they are not that timid. So thank you again um, for everyone, for all your support, for all of your prayers. And there's a lot more pictures posted on Facebook um, that if you want to see more, we can share more. But, um, and then BGMC Sunday... Um, for the kids is going to be on Lima, Peru. So you guys have that to look forward to. So now we're going to go ahead and get started. And we're going to do just a little bit of brief um, updates on a couple of things. And then we're going to get into the message. So the first thing is Kids Zone. Um, 
We've made a couple of little changes in the back with Kids Zone and the format, the, the way that we do things back there. So we do worship. We usually do like a Hillsong, a few songs of worship, and then just similar to what we did up here this morning, except we use the videos. And then um, we have a lesson, and then we'll have some type of an activity that teaches the lesson to them. Um, they're going to get started. Um, they're going to start getting memory verses coming home because we really want to get the Word of God planted in their heart, not just teaching them the stories, but we want to get it planted in their heart. Um, so we're also going to be launching um, a give campaign for BGMC. Um, we want the kids to have a heart for giving, to understand the biblical principles of giving. Um, so moms, dads, they may be hitting you up for an extra chore here and there for, to earn a dollar. The amount that, we're, that they give isn't the important thing to us right now. We want them to have the heart to give. Yes. So even if they're putting a penny in their barrel a day, it's fine. We just want them to have that heart of giving to do that. So um, we hope that when they come home and they're saying, hey, what can I do to earn some more money for BGMC, that you will help them with that. Um, parents, you're also receiving newsletters now. Um, right now they're bi-monthly to kind of give you a, an idea of what's going on in Kids Zone, but also what's coming up in Kids Zone. Um, so VBS was a great success this year. We saw great strides forward in um, the kids and their relationships. <laughs> See, you're always young. Where's you at? Where you at, Ron? <laughs> you're always young. It depends on what you think in your heart, right? Um, we saw great strides forward in kids and their relationships with Jesus this year, and um, it was an awesome sight to see them really having um, good worship and good um, altar times and them really making efforts and, and getting to know um, Jesus closer. We also look forward to more events coming up. Um, we have Trunk or Treat coming. We have the Christmas play that's getting ready to start getting underway. Um, and we're going to start in the new year um, what we call Food and a Flick Night. So it's going to be basically dinner and a movie for kids. So um, the parents, you can drop them off, leave them for a couple hours, and then pick them back up. Okay. <laughs> but that will be coming in after the new year. Um, so Thrive is our youth group. Um, and youth is going well. We are growing and maintaining um, our numbers, which we like to see more coming out, but it's a process and it's a journey. So um, we meet twice a week, Sunday morning during Sunday school, and then um, once on Tuesday nights. So we're getting ready to start some foundational teachings, and it's all going to be on what we believe. Um, and so I'm looking forward to the discussions we're going to have in those groups. That's going to be fun. We always have great discussions in youth. Huh? <laughs> so we try to schedule um, activities throughout the quarter for the youth. Um, we've been ice skating. We've played laser tag. We've gone and had a progressive dinner. Um, we've had a pool party. We had to cancel King's Dominion, and I have to make that out somehow. But we have youth convention coming up, and that is going to be an awesome and amazing time for them. Um, the theme this year is Illuminate. Um, they have a great speaker coming in. They have a Christian comedian coming in. Um, the registration rate for the convention is $84 for the early bird rate, which we want to take advantage of. Um, and I've kind of done some number crunching, and I think if we add $100 to that, that'll cover for hotel rooms and van rental and gas and possibly some extra food. But... Um, we're going to be doing some fundraisers to help do that, um, but if you have it in your heart to give towards that, you can just put youth convention and drop it in. We'll accept it. Um, but at this time, I'd like to recognize anyone that works with um, the youth and the kids and the and church throughout any of the services. So for Sunday school, um, we have Janelle, which I think she is actually in the back still. Right? Yeah. So we have Janelle, um, Libby, Diane, Sissy, and now Miss Betta Mitchell. So if you guys could stand and stay standing. Yeah, I know it's embarrassing. Um, for Kid Zone, we also have Janelle, um, Joanna, Gabriella, um, Brenda Thomas, Damon, Amaya, and Morgan. And for CIA on Wednesday nights, we have Miss Karen. <laughs> so if you guys could just let's link them together for all that they do. Thank you. You guys can be seated. Um, I know it looked like we have a lot of workers, but we can always use more. 
So if you are interested in helping out, whether it's in Sunday school, maybe just being a backup, a substitute, um, if it's on Wednesday nights, we're getting to where we're going to have to start splitting them up into different age groups soon. Um, if it's on Sunday morning back in Kids Church, or if you would like to be brave enough and bold enough to come and help me on a Tuesday night with youth, come see me because we can always use more help. All right. So 15 minutes. I can get it done. <laughs> Who believes in me? <laughs> All right. So, huh? Yeah. So when I first started praying about <laughs> when I first started praying about the message for youth, which was supposed to be like a month ago, but then things happened and and um, God was in control. But um, when I started first praying about it, um, the phrase "stand up and stand firm" kept coming to mind. And since then, it has been repeated everywhere I go. Um, in fact, when I found out the message and the lessons that I was going to be teaching when I was in Peru, it was all about peer pressure, which included stand up and stand firm. <laughs> and then a lot of the messages that I've been listening to on my podcast and um, on different channels and everything have all been focused on standing up, focused on standing firm. So apparently it is a message I'm supposed to be hearing over and over and over again. But um, youth today, from the youngest all the way up to the oldest, are constantly bombarded with worldly influence. Um, through the movies, television, cartoons included, the music we listen to, the games we play, whether they're board games, video games, or whatever kind of games, um, the books that we read that are available, even the books that are being assigned in school, all these things, everything that surrounds us is bombarding us with worldly influence. It's all screaming for attention. And it's all trying to pull them this way or that way. And it's anything to pull them away from their relationship with Jesus. Um, and adults, we know those same pressures as well. It's not just on the kids, right? We go through those things. And when it works, it doesn't always look like it's a bad thing. When that distraction happens, it doesn't always look like it's a bad thing. It doesn't always look like sin. We call it compromise, in the church, right? And it begins to slowly chip away at the bricks in your wall. It begins to slowly chip away in that foundation that we have when we allow that compromise in our life. Um, I feel like God has a very timely message for all of us this morning. Again, from the youngest to the oldest that's here. We are called to stand up and to stand firm in Jesus. Um, Billy Sunday was an evangelist from the late 1800s to the early 1900s. In fact, he was a professional baseball player before he got saved. And when he got saved, he changed his life completely, and he began to be an evangelist. And um, one of the stories that he was well known for telling was about a Christian that got a job, job at a lumberjack camp. And um, one of his friends found out that he got this job at this lumberjack camp, and he was like, dude... These people don't like Christians. You are going to have a hard year when you go away. And he's like, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. So he goes, and he comes back, and he runs back into this friend. And he's like, how'd it go? How'd it go? Was it really hard being in that hostile camp? And he was like, no, no, no. They never even knew I was a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> and while initially that story seems funny, it's really sad. When we think about it, we can see how problematic that really is. He was there for a year, and nobody ever knew he was a Christian. As Christians, as believers, as children of the Most High, we are called to be influencers of this world Amen. rather than being influenced by the world. We are called to stand out. We are called to be weirdos, if you will. 1 Peter 2.9 and I'm going old school, I'm going King James, because that's how I memorized it. <laughs> but I'm a throw, you know, crystal. I can't say the yees and stuff. That's weird. But it says, um, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You know, this verse, when I was growing up, was my jam. I just have to tell you all that. Like, when people would come to me and they did this a lot, and they still do, you are so weird. And I'm like, I know. 
but I am called to be a chosen people. I am called to be a peculiar person. In fact, sometimes I would even start singing the Maranatha praise song. You know what I'm talking about? For ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that we should show forth the praises of him. Yeah. So then they would walk away shaking their head. (laughs) But that was okay. But let me read it to you again out of the message this time. Starting with verses 9 and 10, it says, We have been chosen by God for the high calling, instruments to do his work and speak out for him. And then we're going to go on just a little bit further because it's hard to stand up and go against the crowd. But this is why we shouldn't be worried about what the world says about us. In verse 11 and 12, it says, uh, can you put that up for me? Yeah. Friends, this world is not your home. So don't make yourselves cozy in it. Don't indulge your ego at the expense of your soul. What a powerful phrase that is. Don't indulge your ego at the expense of your soul. How often do we get caught up in what they are thinking about us and we give in to whatever the crowd wants? Don't indulge your ego at the expense of your soul. Today we're going to look at an example of a couple of people in the Bible that stood up and stood strong for God and in his word. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were some young Hebrew boys that uh, were taken captive when Babylon was besieged by Jerusalem. And all of them were from the tribe of Judah. And they all found favor with King Nebuchadnezzar. Um, We're going to look at these three And we're going to find their, you can find their account in Daniel 3. I'm not going to read scripture for the whole thing. I'm just going to kind of summarize their account. Um, But Nebuchadnezzar had a huge golden image built as a symbol of his power and his glory. Um, Then he commanded that everyone had to bow down and worship it whenever they heard some music play by his music herald. Do you remember those those storybook things in school? And it would say, when you hear the ding, turn the page. It was kind of like that. When you heard the music, you had to bow down and worship the idol, right? So um, if you didn't, if you disobeyed this, then you were thrown into an immense blazing furnace. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego worshipped God only. Okay, They followed the commandments, which we've been learning back in Kid Zone. In fact, we talk about uh, the golden calf not too long, a couple, couple weeks ago, that um, Aaron and the Israelites built when Moses was on the mountain and how they started to worship them and how it all went wrong from there, right? But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego followed the commandments, including you should not have any other gods before me, including you should not worship any other idols before me, and you should not worship any other gods. So they refused to bow down to the idol. They were brought before King Nebuchadnezzar to face their fate. And then they continued to stand up and to stand strong. They were courageous. So we're going to look in Daniel 3, 14 through 18. It says, now when you hear the sound, and where are we at, 14? Yeah. And Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And if if he will deliver us from your majesty's hand, but even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. I think that it is um, interesting that while they still refused, they were still respectful because they still addressed him as majesty. So they refused to bow down to the idol. He was furious with rage, right? And in fact, he was so mad and so angry that he ordered the furnace to be turned up seven times hotter than it was. He ordered them to be bound and tied up. 
And the soldiers that took them over to the furnace died because it was so hot. The three fell into the furnace. And in amazement, it says in the scripture, in amazement, King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet because he saw four men walking around freely in the furnace. That meant they were no longer bound. <laughs> that meant they weren't burnt to a crisp. <laughs> they were walking around, but there was also four people in there. And he said, one of them looked like the son of God's. And he looks at his people around him. He's like, oh, wait a minute. Didn't we just throw pe three people in there? <laughs> and they all confirmed it, but there was four. So he goes to it and he tells them to come out of the furnace. And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they come out. Not a hair is singed on them. Their clothes is not, are not ruined. They don't even smell like smoke. And in verse 28, Nebuchadnezzar says, if you could pop that up for me. We're using the Sky Bible today because... Yeah, you're fine. I must have forgotten that one. <laughs> Ben does a great job back there, by the way. Yes. Thank you, ben. So, verse 28, there you go. It says, Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're going to be cut in pieces. So, <laughs> not only did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego make an impression on King Nebuchadnezzar, but he made it such an impression that he changed the decree for the nation, right? They were raised to serve and worship God, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they knew what was written about the one true God. But it is obvious from their story that it was more than just a head knowledge. It was something that they experienced. It was something that they knew. It was a personal relationship with this one true God that they lived out on a regular basis. When taken captive and they were put into a new way of living, it could have been very easy for them to fall into the ways of the place that they had become captives of. It could have been very easy for them to take on those um, beliefs and those traits and to begin to live their life the same way. But they were courageous. And they um, stood up for what they had already been taught when they were growing up. Think about how many times they probably heard the passage from Joshua 1, be strong and very courageous. And how many times did they call on that passage when they were walking through this time in their life when they were taken captive? One day, they didn't probably understand or even fathom that they would face death for doing so. They probably didn't realize that it was going to be um, a life or death situation when they had to stand up and stand firm in God. So how can we come to be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? How can we stand up and stand firm even when we're faced with adversity, even when we have people who are persecuting us for our beliefs, even when we have people who are poking fun at us and joking us for being followers of Jesus and coming to church. Well, first off, we have to know who we're standing for. And in knowing who we stand for, we know who we stand against. Um, we already mentioned that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew and they worshiped the one true God. They knew who they were worshiping. Another person who knew who they were worshiping and who they stood for was David. And when he faced Goliath, he told Saul in um, 1 Samuel 17, verse 34, he told them exactly what he knew. He said, David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it struck it and rescued the sheep from its mouth. And when it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, but this Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. David knew who he stood for. He said, the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of the Philistine. Saul said to David, and we'll go. 
<laughs> May the Lord be with you. I mean, what are you going to say to that? David knew who he stood for, and he knew who he stood against, anyone who came against the Lord, right? So <clears throat> we have to be, we have to have more than just the head knowledge of who God is in our life. And when we have that real relationship with God, when we have that true relationship with God, that we are walking with him, that we experience it on a regular basis, we know without a shadow of a doubt who we are standing up for. And when we know who we are standing up for, we know who is coming against us, right? So the second thing we have to um, put in place to be able to stand up and stand firm is we have to know the power and the authority in which we're standing. Um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew. In fact, they told the king, look, God could rescue us. Great. And even if he doesn't, we're still not going to worship you because we're still going to be with him. Um, scripture tells us that the same power that raised Christ from the dead is in us Hallelujah. as a believer. That means when we become a follower of Christ, we take on the mantle of Christ. Um, we take on his power. We take on his strength. We take on his authority. And we move forward in that. We should move forward in that. Um, David also showed this when he was facing Goliath. In fact, he told Goliath, he said, You come against me with your sword and your javelin and your spear, but I come against you in the name of the Lord. I don't know about you, but I prefer the name of the Lord as opposed to the, the sword and the spear. But... Um, he said, I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. You see, we have the power. We have to know the power, and we have to know the authority that we're standing in before we can actually stand up, and before we can actually stand firm. So we have to have the knowledge of who we are standing for, and we have to have the knowledge of the power and the authority in which we are standing. And lastly, we have to be prepared to stand up and to stand firm. So how do we do this? We do it by putting on the armor every single day. Um, if you turn to Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, we get the passage about the armor. It says, um, in fact, everything that I have said basically today so far could be summed up in this passage. I know, so why did I just read the passage and we could all be done? But hey, <laughs> it is what it is, right? So here it is. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep, being, keep on praying for all the Lord's people. So this passage sums up everything we've talked about this morning so far. We are told to be strong in the Lord, to be strong in His power, not our own, right? We are told to put on the full armor of God. Don't miss a piece of it. You know, if you miss a piece, then you're leaving a part of you vulnerable to the enemy. Those pieces, each one had a very vital role in what they protected and what they kept that soldier safe from. And um, it is very important for us. So when you're getting ready in the morning, I know it seems cheesy. It's okay. When you're fixing your hair, don't forget your helmet, right? <laughs> when you put your clothes on, go ahead and put all that stuff on. Even if you just have like your uh, different verses of, a, of the armor of God put in different places where you get ready in the morning. So that each part of your getting ready process, I know I have a routine. I don't know how many of you have a routine. And if you veer off of that routine any minute, you might go to work without your deodorant. Anybody else? No? Okay. Just me? Okay. <laughs> it's okay. I keep extra in the car. 
<laughs> but honestly, like I have a morning routine. So I have everything in an order and a time and a place that I do when I get ready in the morning. They're laughing. See, I told you I was weird. But what if we were to put the armor of God's scripture in each one of those parts and we put a part of the armor on as we did our morning routine? How much ready for the day? How much ready to stand up and stand firm in God would we be and more be we be more prepared for the day and what comes at us. Don't miss a piece of the armor. Young people, um, yeah, you can come on up. Young people, you're going to face adversity. You're going to face people poking fun at you. You're going to face people leaving you out of things because of your choices and your beliefs and what you stand for. Older people, you're going to face the same things. I know um, there's different people in my life that I've had to let go because they kept wanting me to do things with them that I don't do. And every time we would go out to dinner, they would be like, just, just do it. Nobody, nobody's here with us. Just drink. And I'm like, I don't drink. I don't have any desire for it. It's not what God has called me to do. God has called me beyond that. And they just didn't get it. And while I was still having fun, they were feeling horrible later on. But we're all going to face persecution of some type of way. You're going to face um, people making fun of you, people trying to pull you in different directions, people trying to influence you because I'm going to tell you, misery loves company. And when they're caught up in something, they don't want to be caught up in it alone. They don't care how much it destroys you. The enemy doesn't care how much it destroys you. That's what his goal is. He's trying to pull you away. People can make fun of you. People can leave you out. But we have to remember we have something greater. We have to remember to stand up for what God has called us to do. We have to remember to stand firm in who God is. In that moment, when people are coming against you, when you're facing with the persecution, what will you do? How will you react? Because we've all been called from the youngest to the oldest. We have all been called to influence the world. When I opened up the service, I opened up with 1 Timothy 4. You can put that back up. Yeah. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, because of your age. But set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come. Devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to preaching and to teaching. We're called to stand up. We are called to stand firm. We are called to stand strong. We are called to set an example, to be an influencer on this world in our speech, in our actions, in our behaviors, in our love, in our faith, in our purity. We are called to be set apart. Are you an influencer like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Are you an influencer like David was? Are you being influenced? Remember, they influenced a king, and in turn, they influenced a nation. Are you ready to stand? When I opened up in worship this morning, I told you that the line from that song that says, our breath and our lungs are borrowed. When you think about that for a moment, God breathed his life into you. What are you doing with that life for him? This morning we're going to play a song. Um, it's called The Stand. You can stand and you can worship with it. Or you can sit at your seat worship with it but I want you to think about it are you ready to stand 
Are you able to stand firm? Are you able to stand strong? Do you need to make a decision today to say, you know what, no matter what comes against me, no matter what I face in life, no matter what anybody says about me, no matter what people talk about me behind my back, I'm willing to stand up for Christ today. I'm willing to influence the world around me.